Welcome, everyone. My name is John Paul Jones. I'm the Don Bennett Moon Dean of the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences, the University of Arizona's People College. It's a pleasure to welcome you to Soundscapes, our sixth annual downtown lecture series. I want to give a shout out and thanks again to Eduardo Costa, our musical performer in the prelude. Eduardo is a volunteer for the Healing and Arts Program of Tucson Medical Center. And they have a very innovative holistic wellness program that focuses on both the sonic and visual arts. And I'm delighted to thank Tucson Medical Center once again. They were with us here in the beginning for our 2013 lecture series on happiness, and they're here again with us um, supporting for uh, our topic on music, place, and identity. Music. We know it like art. We know when we like it, but what does it do to us? At a personal level, it is both corporeal and effective. It brings us joy, it helps us express love, and it can urge us to action. It can also trigger trauma, it can make us think of loss, it can promote sad memories as well as happy ones. At a social level, it is deeply social and cultural embedded in time and place, and part of our wider social relationships. It is both the product of and the shaper of social and group identity. It makes us a bit who we are, but in the process of doing that, it not only forges social bonds, but it is also very important in the process of social exclusion. One question that we might ask in this lecture series is if we can hear different music, if we can hear music differently, can we learn to get along better? I have a few people that I would like to thank. Our title sponsors, Mike and Beth Kasser and Hoalua Companies. Our supporting sponsors, my good friends, financial and spiritual advisors, Ken and Linda Robin, and our community sponsors, the delightful doctors Vivi and Adib Sabah and Barbara Starrett and Joanne Ellison. Thank you all for contributing to this series. No one would be here without media, and no one would be here without Arizona Public Media. From the people on campus to the people behind this curtain, uh, we're delighted that they have joined us for this sixth straight year. And uh, I want to thank uh, AZPM for their support. Also, I want to thank the Arizona Daily Star. Thank you for being in existence. Thank you for being here. And this year, we're very proud to announce a new partnership with KXCI, Community so Supported Radio. And you'll be hearing more about that relationship with the podcast series that is being organized by my colleague uh, here in the front, Professor Al Bergeson of the School of Sociology. Thank you, Al, and thank you, KXCI. And then there are our downtown partners, and foremost among them I want to thank Maynard's Market and Kitchen and the Hotel Congress, and especially Richard and Shana Oseron, downtown pioneers and also people that I am proud to call very close friends. Thank you. 
A neat part of this series is after every lecture, we'll have a short set, three songs, and uh, after that, you can amble over to the Hotel Congress, grab a drink, and hear more songs from the same artist uh, on the patio. So that's a special collaboration between us and SBS and the Hotel Congress. And I want to thank them very much for accommodating us. I'm also very pleased to recognize tonight for the first time the collaboration between SBS and this event and AC Hotel by Marriott Downtown Tucson, and I want to thank Rudy and Scott. Thank you very much for your support. <laughs> Park Tucson, Downtown Tucson Partnership, both also very supportive of this work that we're doing, and of course, I would be remiss if I did not have us all recognize that we are in one of the finest downtown theaters in the country, the Tucson Fox Theater, in this beautiful place. Thank you, Fox Theater and Craig Sumberg. Our speaker tonight is Professor Jake Harwood of the Department of Communication in the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences. Jake. Jake received his PhD in 1994 from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and he went to the University of Kansas and then joined us in 2002. Um, he is also, in addition to his other duties and his fantastic research, is serving this year as acting head of the Department of Communication, and so he's got a lot on his plate right now. I'm very appreciative. Uh, of him uh, agreeing to be uh, the inaugural kickoff speaker for this series. Jake's area of specialization is intergenerational and intergroup communication. So someone who's got that as an area of study is eventually going to trip over music. And he tripped over music in a big way this year with the publication of his new book, Communication and Music in Social Interaction. And it would be at this point that I would say, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Professor Jay Carwood, but I do want to emphasize that as soon as he is done, we will have a musical performance, and in this case, tonight, by Tucson's own band, Squirrel, S-Q-W-R-L, which is led by none other than SBS alum and honorary degree recipient, Fletcher McCusker, man about downtown, leader behind Rio Nuevo, Second Saturdays. He's got a great band, CEO, a CFO, a pharmacist, a physician, an insurance agent, an IT specialist. All of these guys make up Squirrel, a smoking rock band. You'll have to ask them what they're smoking. And now, please give a warm welcome to Professor Jake Harwood. Thank you all so much for uh, being here. Spoiler alert. If you are a fan of Korean zombie movies, and, and I'm guessing some of you are, and you haven't seen the movie Train to Busan, then just avert your gaze for the next couple of minutes. 
the zombies have taken over Korea. Two survivors are heading for the safe zone, which, as you can imagine, is guarded by some hyper-vigilant Korean troops. They're looking for zombies. few more human things that we can do than to sing, to make music. It signals our humanity. It distinguishes friend from enemy. Zombies cannot sing. <laughs> In the late 1970s, when we sent Voyager's spacecraft to the edges of our solar system, we sent with them a record containing music to signal to alien civilizations who we are. We are wired for sound. And we've been wired for sound for a long time. Uh, this is a flute, one of the oldest, the oldest perhaps, um, musical instrument that archaeologists have discovered was found in a cave in Germany, and it's about 36,000 years old. To put that in context, that's when your great, 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 great time 1600, grandparents were alive. Um, we were being hunted by bears. We were living primitive unhappy lives for the most part. But we bothered to make flutes out of animal bones. Music is not a luxury. As a communication scientist, this sort of discovery makes me wonder, what is music doing for us? Why were we carving flutes out of bones? when we were being eaten by bears. I think music does at least three really important things for us. It signals emotion. It lets us feel things with other people. It signals movement. It lets us move together with other people. And it signals group identity. It tells us who we belong with as, as people. 
So I'm going to talk about those three things this evening. Let's start with emotion. One theory of the origins of human communication says that we began communicating with a very primitive, what's sometimes called a musy language. This musy language would have been a mix of what today we call music and language. And probably what it sounded like was awful. Um, this was probably a mix of screeches and grunts and groans, and it probably relied heavily on intonation, and it probably relied heavily on nonverbal communication, a lot of gestures. And so the theory goes, over time, this music language split into language that we use for expressing concrete ideas, thoughts, beliefs, and music, which we use for expressing emotion. So music is essentially a specialized emotional communication tool. The evidence for this split comes from a few places. Um, if you look at the ways in which we are constantly driven to combine language and music, almost like we want to force them back into that music language. Think about song. Every culture on earth, song is the most popular form of music that people can consume. People are driven for some reason towards this combination of music and language. The fact that language and music might share a common origin is also evident in some connections between um, the ways in which we express emotion and the musical qualities of our speech that help us express emotion when we're angry versus when we're in love. The, it's the volume with which we speak, the speed with which we speak, um, the pitch of our speech illustrates the emotion that we're um, experiencing. Sometimes the link between language and music gets pretty strange. I'm going to play you a, a somebody reading, reading a sentence, and it should sound like somebody reading a sentence. So you're following along so far. Good. The sounds as they appear to you are not only different from those that are really present, but they sometimes behave so strangely as to seem quite impossible. Sound fairly normal? All right. I'm now going to take a little section of that um, sentence and play it repeatedly. This is going to be quite boring, so just, again, bear with me. Just listen to this section being repeated. There are no fancy audio gizmos here. It's just a tape loop. But they sometimes behave so strangely. They sometimes behave so strangely. 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 Some Did ever, everyone uh, or most of you experience a sort of shift from language to music? Right? This is what happens when our brains tell us there, there's no useful information there, right? You've heard, you've heard the words, and so our brains start cluing into the musical qualities in the speech. And once you've heard that, you will never get rid of it. So <laughs> I'm going to play the sentence again for you. Oh, oh, and yeah, you can write it. The sounds as they appear to you are not only different from those that are really present, but they sometimes behave so strangely as to seem quite impossible. It's weird, right? It's like she's breaking out into song in the middle of the sentence. 
It's called the speech to song illusion. It was created by, or discovered, um, by a psychologist called Diana Deutsch, illustrating the musical qualities in language. But let's get back to, to emotion. Um, so if motion, emotion, uh, excuse me, if music is a specialized emotion communication tool, then we should experience some unique emotions when we're listening to music. And that's true. When we talk to people about their musical experiences, they describe spine-tingling experiences. They describe goosebumps. They describe shivers going down their spine. And music psychologists will often use the term super expressive to describe some of these effects of music. That music expresses emotions that language and most of our other experiences in life cannot express. I'm going to play you an example of one of the musical characteristics that elicits this kind of intense, super expressive emotional uh, experience. One of the musical phenomena that causes this is, is really people getting stuff wrong. Not super wrong, but just a little bit wrong. Um, music has a regular beat to it, most music has a regular beat to it. Most music has some sort of scale, musical scale, associated with it. And we expect when people play music that they stay on the beat and that they play the right notes. But when, music, when musicians deviate just a little from the right note or from staying on the beat, we often have these intense emotional responses to it. Uh, this is a little snippet of a piece by, uh, played by Archie Shepp, a great tenor saxophonist. And it's a very familiar tune, and you'll hear him stretching time and stretching the musical pitch as he's playing it. <laughs> Nice, right? Um, a a uh, musicologist called Carl Seashore described this best, I think. He said, deviation from the exact is the medium for the creation of the beautiful. I could not put it better. There's a tension when people deviate from precision. And there's a humanity there, right? Computers have an incredibly hard time deviating just the right amount. And another musical feature that elicits int intense emotional responses is surprise. Um, particularly changes, for instance, dramatic changes in volume, move, moving from quiet to loud, or from loud to quiet. Surprise in terms of the musical texture or tone color of the music can also elicit intense emotional responses. This next clip, if you didn't like Archie Shep, 
Maybe you'll like Pink Floyd. Um, this features both of those things. You'll he hear a dramatic change from quiet to loud. Brace yourselves. And you'll, immediately after that, you, you'll hear a guitar enter and, and change the texture of, of the sound. Would you sell your story to Rolling Stone? Would you take the children away? Guitar, it gets me every time. What's important here is not that music, music, uh, uh, th that we have emotional responses to music. I'm guessing all of you knew that. Um, what's what's important for me, particularly, is that these are social experiences. We experience them with each other. Right now, we're experiencing those emotions with each other. We experience them with the artist. So as we're listening to those p pieces of music, I mentioned that there's a humanity to, to the sound that we're hearing. There's a human being on the other side, and I think we, 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 we know that when we're listening. This means that music is not just an emotional communication uh, tool. It's really an empathy training device. It helps us understand other people's emotions. I'm going to come back to that thought in a little bit. So music helps us feel together. It also helps us move together. The ability to move in time to a beat, to a musical beat, is called entrainment. Um, entrainment can occur internally. So, so when you're listening to a piece of music, your heart rate, for instance, can become coordinated with the music. But I'm more interested in the external. When we listen to a piece of music, we can move our bodies in time with the piece of music. This is quite complicated, but I'm going to attempt to illustrate this for you. All right? Um, okay, so it's not complicated. Except that it is, right? Think about what, what's going on there. There's this musical stimulus coming in, Stevie Nicks in all her glory, but there's guitars and drums and other stuff floating around, and I'm abstracting a regular pulse out of all of that complexity, and I'm simultaneously producing movements in time with that pulse. This is a very complex thing to accomplish, but we can all do it very easily. It's almost a uniquely human characteristic. Almost. <laughs> Meet Snowball. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Good night. That is, that is the best part of the talk. I, 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 I got to be honest with you. Surprisingly, our, our nearest relatives can't do this. Chimpanzees, gorillas, they are lousy at keeping a beat. Um, but parrots, cockatoos, um, and related birds, uh, Snowball is a sulfur-crested cockatoo for the ornithologists in the crowd. Um, they, they can do this, and it has something to do with, or it's related to their ability to mimic speech, right? Parrots are pretty good at that, too. Um, but they're not that good at it. Snowball loses the beat fairly often, has to be sort of reminded of the beat. It's Friday tomorrow. It's going to be slow at work. There's lots of snowball videos on YouTube. So <laughs> you can become more familiar with his level of skill. Um, this entrainment ability that humans have, again, is a social ability. It's not just about me at home dancing around my kitchen all on my own. It's that entrainment allows us to move in time with each other. If we're moving in time with the music, we can move in time with one another. This lets us dance together. It lets us sing work songs that control the pace of our work and they, that coordinate the movements of our work. It, it lets us sing along. We could not sing along to a piece of music if we couldn't entrain to the regular beat of the music. Interestingly, when we move together with other people, we also like them more. That's why I said that we like each other more, because one person out of all of you <laughs> joined in. You should be ashamed. <laughs> but we now have a special bond. When you see someone moving in a coordinated manner with you, you perceive them as more similar to you, and similarity is associated with liking. In some of our University of Arizona research, we've looked at this phenomenon in parent-child relationships. Uh, this is work I did with Sandy Wallace in the communication department. <laughs> Sandy may or may not be in the house. <laughs> so we looked at whether, we looked at um, the extent to which college students rep reported having engaged in musical activities with their parents when they were young, when they were little kids, and when they were adolescents. And we asked them how much they felt in sync with their parents when they performed tasks with them. And we just asked them how, how well they get along with their parents. And we found fairly consistent associations where Adult children, if they had uh, engaged in musical activities with their parents when they were younger, felt more in sync with their parents, and actually had stronger relationships with their parents. Interestingly, we also found a similar pathway, but through feeling emotionally connected to their parents, feeling empathy for their parents, and I said I would get back to empathy. So you ha have these dual complementary pathways from musical activity to having a stronger relationship, passing through both the coordinated physical activity and the shared emotional experience. So on a practical level, parents, do musical activities with your kids. Listen to music together. As a professional, I recommend Ziggy Stardust. <laughs> but you can go, go your own way if you want.
Yeah. Interestingly, and to take this up a level or two of abstraction, the musical phenomena associated with the top path and the bottom path are different from one another, and in, in fact, a little bit contradictory. So what, what does music need for you to synchronize with it? It needs regularity. You can't synchronize unless you have a regular pulse to your music. What does music need for you to feel emotionally connected? We already talked about that. Unpredictability, getting off the beat, a sudden surprising loud noise. Well, guess what? The music that people enjoy the most balances those two things. It's unpredictable enough, but not too unpredictable. In fact, if you look at people's greatest musical experiences, they tend to follow what we call an inverted U or a rainbow, right? On the one hand, on the left, I'm not good at mirrors and things. On the left, you have music that we might tip, typically think of as too complex or too unpredictable. John Cage, Schoenberg, Anthony Braxton. And if you're not familiar with Anthony Braxton, This is what we listen to on road trips in my family. <laughs> this is why my children hate me. <laughs> on the other end of the continuum, enjoyed your elevator ride. <laughs> this is music that's too predictable, right? There are very few people who want to listen to that for very long. W what we tend to prefer is music that's somewhere in the middle, that um, is unpredictable enough, it can surprise us, it can provide those intense emotional experiences, um, but that's not so surprising that we don't know where we are. One difference between the two ends, I'm not trying to uh, suggest they're equivalent. If you listen to enough Anthony Braxton or Schoenberg, you can grow to enjoy it. You become more uh, familiar with the ways in which the music works. It becomes more predictable and it can provide those emotional and coordinating uh, effects. Muzak, on the other hand, the more you listen to it, the more you want to stab yourself. <laughs> the kind of synchronization that I've been talking about so far has been sort of largely small group, a couple of people, parents and children, People, people singing a work song. Synchronization can also occur on, on a much larger scale. And I can't see you all that well, but I'm not seeing a crowd that is um, highly familiar with electronic dance music. <laughs> well then, this is a learning experience for you. 
Yes, yes, here we go. Only to the left. That is from an electronic dance music festival that occurred in, in Holland. Um, but these festivals occur all over. They occur in Tucson. Uh, four, four or five years ago, whenever, when I first taught a course on communication and music, one of the first questions I asked my students was, what music do you listen to? What do you like? And about half the class said, electronic dance music. And I, I had never heard of it, but it, it's a huge, hugely popular style of music among young people. Um, and, and it's very popular in this sort of festival format. One thing I love about that video cl clip is that you see this intense synchronization, massive scale synchronization. And then you see people hugging each other, kissing each other. You see this connection between the synchronization that's occurring and feelings of interpersonal connection and, and love between these individuals. The other thing that seeing music on such a massive scale connects us to is the uses of music in ritual, in cultural ritual. We don't get married without music. We don't die without music. And this illustrates a different form of music-related cultural ritual. Which brings us to our third bubble. Group identity. Music isn't just an individual experience. It's not just a dyadic experience. It's a group experience. It's audience participation time. I know I have one person ready to... <laughs> It's time for the rest of you to pull your weight now. We have a Jamaican flag, an Indian flag, and a German flag. We're going to listen to a little music, and you have to tell me where it's from. Did I hear an Indian? Very good. This is Anusha Shankar. Daughter of Ravi Shankar, uh, who some of you may have heard of. All right, number two. very short clip because it's all I could stand. <laughs> this is from... Very good. Oh, you guys are fabulous. We'll go back and we'll do this again later. <laughs> Classic polka music from Germany. So, music transports us to these cultures. We have very strong associations between musical styles and countries, ethnic groups, cultural groups, religious groups. For outsiders, right, these provide sort of almost a musical tourism. We experience a little of what it's like to visit India or Germany when we listen to the music. For insiders, for people from particular cultures with particular musical traditions, of course, these are profound experiences of this is who I am. This is part of me. I know, I know you all want to visit Jamaica, so we'll listen to a little reggae music, surprisingly. Yeah. No, Jack, 
It's a band called Aswad. Um, interestingly, Aswad are not a Jamaican band. It's true. Uh, they're a British band. Their parents immigrated from Jamaica to Britain as part of a, a large wave of immigration from the West Indies to Britain in the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, that generation of immigrants was called the Windrush generation, uh, uh, named after one of the ships that brought them. Um, so for Aswad, this, they are not Jamaican, but this represents their original culture, the, the culture of their parents. Growing up as they did during a time when there were racial tensions in the United Kingdom, reggae represented a positive aspect to their identity, a way to reflect on be, being of Jamaican origin in a positive way. The, uh, uh, poet Linton Kwesi Johnson, who is fr from the same generation, put it like this. Notice that it's being expressed not merely as a, an ethnic identity, but also as a generational identity that reggae was, was a form of cultural identification, but also a, a form of rebellion. Interestingly, and well, perhaps not surprisingly, reggae didn't stay in sort of a hermetically sealed box of people continuing to play reggae uh, because they were of Jamaican origin. As is typically the case with immigrant cultures, their art forms, their cultural values merge with the native cultural values. And so during the 1970s and the 1980s, reggae became infused with, with British cultural styles, British folk music, and particularly the local punk music of that time to create new forms of music, the most notable of which is probably British ska music. This sort of multicultural or polycultural blending of different musical styles is something that Tawana Steptoe in her talk one week from today, same time, same place. <laughs> we try to keep it simple. She's gonna talk about a lo lot in the context of of American popular music of the 20th and 21st century. I'm gonna play you a little British ska music to give you a, a flavor of it. And one thing I want you to pay attention to is the imagery and partic particularly the blending of black and white, both in the performers, but also in the the visuals of this particular uh, video. This is by a band called The Specials, who are fantastic. Even the album covers 
were black and white. The specials became, and British ska more broadly, be, became a musical style that explicitly advocated multiculturalism, polyculturalism. Um, they even founded a record label called, in case you weren't catching on to the theme yet, <laughs> Two-Tone Records. In our data from the University of Arizona, we've demonstrated that watching this kind of musical performance, watching people from different cultures collaborating in a musical uh, performance increases intergroup tolerance, increases people's willingness to have contact with people from other cultures. When you see the benefits of diversity, you're more favorable towards diversity. Uh, that was research I did with Farah Kadar and Chen Yu Chen, just to give credit where it's due. Yo-Yo Ma liked our research. Right? A tweet from Yo-Yo Ma. I was like, I can retire now. <laughs> it's the one and only time I'll be a hashtag. When we ask University of Arizona students about transcendent musical experiences, profound musical experiences, they also describe their experience with music from other cultures. This is one example. Shout out for Tucson Meet Yourself. Coming up in, what, a, a week and a half or so, I think? So get out there. And remember back, I'm not going to play the video again, <laughs> but remember back to our electronic dance music. Notice the flags, right? These are festivals that people go to, and they revel, revel in the, the experience of sharing it with people from other cultures, meeting other cu cultural groups. So this all sounds very positive so far. It's not all sweetness and light, obviously. Any time that anything helps you fe feel uh, uh, like you share a group membership with other people, that also may let you exclude people, other people, different people, right? And music is one way in which we sometimes exclude people. Um, think back to that flute. Imagine people 36,000 years ago living in their cave, playing their flute, and there's another group of people across the way. One of the things the flute does is say, we have resources, we have skills, don't mess with us. This even happens in the animal kingdom. Here's a couple of birds who've be, uh, who have mated and been together for a while, singing a duet. Pretty good, right? Here's a couple of birds who have just met. Not so good, right? <laughs> Interestingly, the first set of birds hold on to their nesting sites. Nobody invades their territory. They're left alone. The second group of birds, <laughs> they lose their nest every time. The coordination of the musical performance sends a message to other people, don't mess with us. And if it's not coordinated, it sends, sends the opposite message. Teams and groups do this.
University of Arizona football teams, haka, a traditional Polynesian dance that in its uh, fully coordinated form is designed to intimidate oppon opponents. Soccer fans do this. As a native Englishman, I take great pride in the creativity of soccer fans. Right? It's fantastic. There were many more that I could play you, but it's a family event. Um, the opposing fans are on the other end, and you're not merely taunting them, but you're taunting them for not singing, right? So the worst possible taunt is, you're not singing. <laughs> this is fairly good-natured so far. It's less good-natured when a Northern Irish Protestant band marches through Catholic neighborhoods and plays Protestant nationalist songs directly outside the Catholic church. So this is music being used to directly provoke the other group in a context where, I'm sure you know, Catholics and Protestants have been in conflict for centuries. Music is used in war. This fellow, and I know you're thinking to yourself, he's so handsome, <laughs> he must be a relative of Jake's. And you would be right. This is my great-grandfather, a fellow by the name of Richard Clark, who in 1889 left South London, where he, he was born and grew up, as did I, and went to the northwest frontier to fight with the Duke of Cornwall's light infantry. The only problem was that he was 13. Things were different back then, you know? So he, he wasn't actually there to fight. He was a drummer boy. Musicians have been an integral part of military activity for almost as long as military activity has existed. Drummer boys coordinated troops, they played in time, so the troops marched in time. They also pumped troops up. They provided that emotional uh, motivation to go into battle. He made it back, obviously. The role of music in war has changed, but it certainly hasn't disappeared. Service members to this day will talk about the ways in which they use music to motivate themselves, to pump themselves up going into battle. At its worst, music is used to encourage destruction of other groups. White power, rock artists advocate explicitly racist messages in their music. A guy called Simon Bikindi used his music to encourage the genocide of over a million Tutsis uh, during the Rwandan Civil War. In Hitler's Germany, 
bright lines were drawn between patriotic music and degenerate music, music like jazz, for instance. So music can be used to divide us, and it can be used to dehumanize other groups, particularly when we take another group's music away. We take away part of what makes them human. But I am an optimist. In Hitler's Germany, people continued to listen to the degenerate music because guess what? They liked it. <laughs> they, that did not make Hitler happy, but there you go. Um, in places where music is banned, it still survives. The movie Timbuktu has some very moving portrayals of people continuing to make music while, while under uh, ISIS control, ISIS having banned music. Music's not a panacea, but I believe that its humanizing power uh, outweighs its dehumanizing power. We are wired for sound, but not because music is beautiful. We're wired for sound because music connects us to other individuals. It lets us feel things that they're feeling. It lets us move together with them. Music is beautiful, but it's not a useless beauty. I'm going to leave the last word to someone who knows a lot more about music than me. And I think this last clip, which is not from a Korean zombie movie, <laughs> this last clip illustrates a lot about the social power of music and its ability to connect us to other individuals, e even individuals who are no longer with us. Relevant. Yeah. Um, I had a dream in the 60s where my mom, who died, came to me in the dream and was reassuring me, saying, it's going to be OK. Just let it be. And I went, oh. I felt so sort of great and like, oh, boy, that, it's going to be great. You know, she gave me the positive word. So I woke up and I went, what was that? What she say, let it be. So I've never heard that. Yeah, that's kind of good. So I wrote the song, Let It Be, but it was her positivity. That's the most beautiful story I've ever heard. When I find myself in times of trouble, my man comes to me, speaking words of wisdom, let it be. Uh -huh. In my hour of darkness, she is standing right in front of me. Speaking words of wisdom, let it be. Yeah, the let it be, let it be, let it be, yeah, let it be. There will be an answer, let it be. Good harmony. Let it be, let it be, let it be. It got me emotional there, Paul. It did, it did. I was I'm sure, not, I didn't feel it coming. It's too much for me. Oh, I, I, I was, I was, uh, no. I couldn't feel, <laughs> I didn't see that one coming around the corner. No. <laughs> That's great, man. You're Jeez. telling you that the power of music. It's weird, isn't it? How that can do that to you? Well, I can remember, I can remember my granddad, who's a musician, mm. and my dad sitting me down and saying, we're going to play you the best song you've ever heard. And I remember them playing me that. Really? If my granddad was here right now, he'd get an absolute kick out of this. He is. Woo! Oh, man. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.